So what do semi-supervised learning? Traditional classifiers need fully labeled data in order to be built. However, labeled data isn't always readily available or it might be expensive to generate. You might need like professionals to label your data. So semi-supervised learning tried to solve this problem by using a mix of labeled and unlabeled data in their model building process. So both unlabeled and labeled data is used in building the classifier. Uh, their results are often better than just supervised learning alone. And it can be, and it also allows us to use much more data than just restricting ourselves to labeled data. So if we can throw in unlabeled data, we suddenly increase the amount of data we can use. So why is it useful? Again, it's useful where labeled data is rare or it requires human experts to accurately label. Some use cases would be like a relevance feedback. So you mark some documents as relevant to a given query, and then you use those marked documents to evaluate the relevance of unmarked documents. Uh, news filtering, so you know you might want to get the most interesting articles of the day for a user based on their previous liked articles. Uh, text classification and natural language processing, you could cluster new data into clusters given previously known groups of categories. So when can it be used? There are some assumptions that have to be met by the data for semi-supervised learning to make sense. So there's uh, the smoothness assumption. So if two points, x and x1 and x2, are in a high density region are close, then show should the corresponding output y1 and y2. Uh, the, the cluster assumption is kind of similar. So if points are in the same cluster, they're likely to be of the same class. And then the manifold assumption kind of just says that you can, that high dimensional data can be well represented in, in a low dimensional space. So here's a, a brief history. So semi-supervised learning uh, model started appearing in literature in the late 60s. Um, and then in the 70s, it came out with transductive learning uh, semi support vector machines and semi supervised support vector machines. Then in the 70s, they moved on to generative models. And then in the 90s, uh, Bowman Mitchell came up with short training models. And finally, there have been some graph based, graph -based methods for semi supervised learning. So now I'll go to through two of the methods. So there's the self training model. So in this, we build a model uh, iteratively, adding more labeled data to the classifier at each iteration. So basically, we have a data set with labeled and unlabeled data, and we build a classifier using only the labeled data. And then we use it to predict the labels on the unlabeled data. And then we pick a select, we pick a subset of those that are, that have the highest likelihood of being correct. They have like the, the best, that you're most confident about. And you add those unlabeled points into your labeled data and then you build your classifier again and you use it to predict on the remaining unlabeled data. You get your most confident predictions, you add it to your labeled data. And you basically keep doing this until all your unlabeled data has been labeled. And then theoretically, this is a pretty good model. Uh, so it, it works well in practice and it's the simplest semi-supervised learning technique. You can, you, can do, you can use any classifier you want. You can use the logistic regression, K and N, whatever you feel like. Uh, the disadvantage is an early, an error learned early in the training process is just going to compound upon itself and might throw off your whole model. And then some possible use cases are well, word, sens word census ambiguation. And then a similar method to this is co-training method. So you have a data set and you split it in half by its features. So say you have 100 variables, you create two data sets with 50 variables each. And then you create two classifiers, you know, classifier one and classifier two, or A and B. And then each classifier labels its unlabeled data and teaches its most um, confident labeling to the other classifier. And then they kind of teach, teach each other. That's why it's called the co-training method. And then you, like in the self-training, you kind of just repeat this process until all unlabeled data is labeled. And then, so you have some assumptions that go along with this. You have to assume that the features can be split into two sets. Sometimes you might have a data set where it doesn't really make any sense to split the features or you don't have enough features to do so. Um, and then if you can split them, you have to assume that the sub-feature sets are good enough to build classifiers. And then you have to also assume that they're kind of sufficiently independent given the class. Then you might ask yourself, how do we split the features? You can do it randomly. So if you have 100 features, you can just split 50-50. Um, you can use domain knowledge to create two splits. So maybe you have, you're, um, you're working in finance and you know that 
this set of features will work and so will this set. And then there's this thing called the entropy split. So you calculate the entropy of each feature in the data set, like we did when we were building the, uh, the roots of a decision tree. And then you rank the features by their entropy and you kind of just split it into two groups along using their entropy rankings. And then Steve will talk about what that group is. Right, so I'm gonna be talking about TSVM and SVVM. So in TSVM, again, sort of happened early on in the uh, 70s. It's sort of a derivative of SVM that it's especially good at labeling otherwise unlabeled data. So while well, SVM can be trained to label data, the problem comes when you're trying to recursively use SVM to build a large scale labeling model. And again, as George said, errors seem to propagate through that model and what you end up with is a great big mess. So, just in terms of mathematics, we can sort of formulate uh, TSVM as a slightly modified SVM minimization problem. Um, in essence, uh, TSVM works to maximize the separation uh, between labeled and unlabeled data, as given by the uh, two long functions here. And this uh, J function is the separation. Uh, TSVM is effective basically have the error rate in certain cases of SVM given the same set of training and uh, test data. Um, and at the worst, uh, TSVM works no worse than SVM, so it's a very good alternative when you're dealing with large sets of unlabeled data. It can also be used for high dimensional problems, and it can be written as mixed integer problems with quadratic objective functions, and as we've seen before, CVX is a very powerful tool. <laughs> so the fact that we can port uh, TSVM into CVX makes it extremely scalable. Uh, so the main package that uh, you can use for TSVM and also S3VM, as I'll show a little later, is called RSSL. It stands for R Semi Supervised Learning Package. I know, real surprising, right? Uh, it takes so TSVM takes three arguments. You have a matrix of un unlabeled data, you have a matrix of labeled data, and a label vector. It's very simple, actually. So here's just a simple write-up. You can pick, you know, copy and paste this into R if you'd like. And it's a, a function you can just call it TSVM. And here's a nice little data set that comes from it. And you can see it does a really good job splitting it. <laughs> but Obviously, this is scalable. This is uh, just a very small example that you know I just figured you guys could run on your machine. But of course, you could scale it up. You could add noise. You could you know throw it into a blender. S three VM is a little different from TSVM. So S three VM works by almost doing a random forest. So what it'll do is generate a whole bunch of uh, possible labelings of your unlabeled data, and it'll do this randomly, more or less. And from those labelings, it will choose which ones have the max separation. So, it, as I said, it's SVBM is to SVM as random forest is to decision trees, in a, in a sense. So. It still works to, again, mar maximize the margin between labeled and unlabeled data, but it builds an SVM for each labeling. And again, here's the objective function, in case you want to write it into uh, something like CVX again, but we don't have our loss term. We have this lambda 1 h squared term that acts as our penalty term. So, some of the advantages to S3VM is it's actually really simple to implement because all you need to do is randomly label your data, run it through SVM, see what you get, and we'll do this a thousand times or so. And so most of the math that you can do with SVM, you can also do with S3VM. So any transformations you want to do on the data that would work in SVM is also just directly scalable to S3VM, so that means, so, although S3VM would seem to be uh, an ideal solution to, F, to sort of uh, the unlabeled 
problem for SVM. It's the S3BM problem is non-convex. So you're not guaranteed to get a global minima solution, even though, you know, if you were to run it for, you know, whatever data set you have, you know, you have all the possible labelings. It's not guaranteed to find the best labeling, even if it goes through all the possible labelings. It's also computationally taxing. SVBM, you know, it, assuming you have two labels, either, you know, one or zero, the binary label, uh, for n data points, you have two dn combinations. So, yeah, if you have, you know, 100,000 data points, you, you're getting into unfeasible territory. <laughs> Uh, so, R doesn't have a dedicated uh, function for S3BM, but it has something a tiny bit better called S4BM, which is, as they call it, safe S3BM. I don't know why it's safe. There's nothing safe about it. <laughs> but it adds a bit more bias um, to the data by dropping functions that binds to be random, but it is quicker. Basically, it just makes sure that uh, SVBM actually does converge to some local minimum. It basically adds a, adds a convergence condition, so I'd recommend using that. It's also part of the uh, TSVM, uh, the package that TSVM is part of. So here's a uh, example of S4BM trying to uh, label some data. So you can see, you know, it goes through multiple iterations before it uh, decides on this cluster, which turns out to have a error rate. And again, here's that picture blown up, basically. Um, and you can see the division between the, the uh, data is actually pretty good compared to the uh, known values. So, uh, hand it over to Zach for some graph-based SSL. All right, so graph-based MS provide learning methods. Talk about what they are, how they're implemented, why it's used, and an example of how it's been used. Uh, so graph-based uh, SSL method is essentially a connected graph that's built from a data set containing both labeled and unlabeled data. Um, when we have a large amount of unlabeled data and a small amount of labeled data, we are able to apply that into a graph model that leverages the information we can gather based on how these nodes are connected, the nodes being data points. Um, the data is represented as weighted, weight, as weighted edges in nodes, the nodes being the data points and the edges uh, being the, the weighted ed edges being the similarity of the nodes that they connect. Um, we assume that the nodes are connected by a large weight edge uh, if they have the same label. Um, and unlabeled data is learned uh, via label propagation um, and it can also be implemented with active learning. Uh, so one of the biggest pieces of the implementation is label propagation, which is essentially going from your original set of labeled data to a better understanding graphically uh, of the unlabeled data. So you begin with a graph of all your data, labeled and unlabeled. Um, as you can see, we've got the labels here for eight, while this eight is unlabeled. Um, and so the labeled data acts like a transmitter uh, that is communicated to the neighboring nodes uh, by proximity or the edge weight. Um, you set an edge weight threshold so that anything uh, that has an edge weight higher than your threshold will be propagated as being the same class as the one that as the node that is connected to. Um, and then that node itself is clamped to that label and then you can run that again uh, and that's how kind of the, the graph is built out. Um, active learning can be implemented in this stage. Um, so essentially, uh, without applying active learning, there's not really a sophisticated order for which nodes uh, will be labeled in, uh, in order. So active learning runs a learning algorithm to identify the unlabeled nodes that are kind of best fit for being next labeled. Um, so you can run your, uh, build your graph, run your label propagation, and then run an active learning sequence, uh, and then kind of feed that back into the loop, uh, and it helps you build out your graph. Um, there are several different algorithms that you can apply uh, for graph-based SSL. Uh, MinCut, which computes modes of a Boltzmann, mach Boltzmann machine. Uh, a harmonic function, which minimizes an energy function by relaxing discrete labels. 
to continuous real values. Um, electrical network, network interpretation, where edges are considered resistors or the conductance, and similar voltage at nodes implies that there are multiple paths connecting those nodes. Um, and then also simply uh, random walk, saying if you walk from node I to node J, and you stop when you hit a uh, labeled node. Um, the biggest type of parameter is the edge weights, uh, which can be calculated by Gaussian or Bayesian processes. Uh, it's used mostly because there's a really clear mathematical framework. Uh, it has great performance potential, especially when your graph matches the task at hand uh, and when you're able to apply active learning. Um, the models labeled and unlabeled, it, it models labeled and unlabeled data jointly during learning, uh, which is kind of a really neat aspect of it. You get to leverage the underlying structure of the data, um, and it can also be applied to directing graphs. Uh, so one cool use case I found uh, was graph-powered machine learning at Google, um, and it implements graph-based SSL methods to understand language and uh, picture data. Um, in this example, they use uh, SSL graph-based graph -based method to uh, understand humor. Um, so it implements a sparse graph built on vectorized word meanings where the words are nodes and the edges are semantic relationships. And then they seed that graph, which essentially means labeling it with emotion labels. Uh, so they label it with happy, funny, laugh, etc. cetera. Um, so you start out with your word embedding vectors, which is a dense continuous space, and then you kind of connect from sad to bittersweet, bittersweet to great, great to awesome. And then eventually you end up with, you can connect laugh to ha ha to R-O-T-F-L, uh, which is pretty impressive considering that that's not even a word. Uh, so it's actually a sentence. Um, so that's all we've got. Thank you. Any questions? Um, can you go back to the ask for the, the, oh, the, the yeah, bot? The yeah, yeah, uh, no, oh, the last, last graph, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's all the labeled data or no, so uh, basically, uh, yeah, I, I sure did a bit better, better job. So uh, the unlabeled data is the uh, minus one. Oh, and, I see. And the labeled data is, is one. So it's trying to partition the data so that the unlabeled data is in its own partition compared to the uh, labeled data. All right, okay. Yeah, sorry. I, Yeah. Yeah, so first of all, I'm 